In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ, on this first Saturday of the month, in the month of March of 2021. Every first Saturday, Mary is honored in a special way, as she requested at Fatima, when she spoke of the first five consecutive Saturdays in which her children are to meditate on all the mysteries of the rosary, offering reparation for sins committed against her Immaculate Heart. Not many people are aware of this first five Saturday devotion, so I wish to talk about it very briefly before resuming the theme during this Lenten season of the Hours of the Passion. Now, the Blessed Virgin Mary, on the evening of December 10th, 1925, it was a Thursday, appeared to Sister Lucia dos Santos. And at the time now, she was in the convent cell. She had already joined the nunnery. And her heart, Mary's heart, was surrounded by thorns. And she said to Sister Lucia, See, my daughter, my heart, surrounded by thorns which ungrateful men pierce at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. Say to all those for five months, on the first Saturday, confess, receive Holy Communion, recite the Rosary, and keep me company for fifteen minutes while meditating on the fifteen mysteries of the rosary in a spirit of reparation. I promise to assist them at the hour of death with all the graces necessary for the salvation of their souls. So, Mary is asking us today, every first Saturday of the month, to go to confession, receive Holy Communion, recite the Rosary, that's five decades, and keep her company for 15 minutes while meditating on all the mysteries of the, 15 mysteries of the Rosary. Now we may wish to go beyond that. It's not compulsory. By meditating on all 20 mysteries, including the luminous mysteries, to offer reparation to the heart of Mary that is offended by the sins, ingratitude, hardness of heart of men and women today. Now, what are these sorrows that Mary experiences? They are five. And these five can be extracted from the revelations of Mary to to Lucia. The first thorn that pierces Mary's heart is caused by those who deny her immaculate conception. That is, those individuals who do not believe that she was conceived without original sin. The second thorn that pierces Mary's heart is caused by those who deny her perpetual virginity. Now, these two dogmas of faith pronounced by Pope Pius IX and Pius XII, are either ignored, not honored, trampled upon, or attacked by individuals. 
the third thorn that pierces Mary's heart, and today we ought to offer reparation for to console her, are caused by those who deny her divine and immaculate, I'm sorry, divine and universal motherhood. For Mary is the mother of each and every child created by God, over whom she exercises her maternal solicitude. Imagine any one of you loving a child, and suppose you are a mother of that child and it is Valentine's Day, and the child does not take any effort, goes to no lengths to so much as thank the mother on that day or present her any gift as a symbol of that gratitude. The mother would feel a little bit hurt. Well, if you were to magnify that on a global scale and consider that there are millions of individuals, if not billions, that deny her these prerogatives, of course she would be hurt. So she turns to the minority, to those of us who honor these prerogatives with which the church honors her to console her heart in this Lenten season. The fourth sorrow is caused by those who treat her with contempt, hatred, and indifference. And the fifth sorrow, those who desecrate her sacred images. Well, today is the first Saturday, so let us join in this Lenten season with our Lord, who is suffering when Mary suffers, by honoring her in this way. We left off the last segment meditating on the 6 p.m. hour when Jesus departs from his blessed mother. Today, we honor the 7 p.m. hour, the Last Supper. Louisa always begins these meditations with an opening prayer as follows. O oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, prostrate in your divine presence, I implore your most loving heart to assist me as I meditate on the 24 hours of your most sorrowful passion. In your passion, your love drove you to suffer so much in your adorable body and in your most holy soul unto death on the cross. I implore your help, your grace, and your love to have profound compassion and a profound understanding of your sufferings as I meditate on this hour. I cannot observe. Please accept my desire to meditate on all the hours, even when I must sleep or tend to my other duties. O oh, most merciful Lord, grant that my loving desire, united to you, may bring your holy blessings down upon us all. I give you thanks, O Jesus, for calling me into union with you by means of prayer. To glorify you, I unite myself with your thoughts, with your tongue, with your heart, with which I intend to pray and I fuse myself in your will and in your love, and extending my arms to embrace you, I place my head upon your heart and begin. O oh Jesus, you now arrive at the cenacle with your beloved disciples, and you begin your supper with them. What sweetness! What graciousness you show throughout your entire being as you lower yourself to take material food for the last time. Everything about you is love. In this also you not only offer reparation for the sins of gluttony, but you implore the sanctification of food. Jesus, my life, your sweet and penetrating gaze seems to search all the apostles. 
Also in this act of taking food, your heart is pierced in seeing your dear apostles still weak and listless, especially the perfidious Judas, who has already put one foot into hell. And you from the bottom of your heart say bitterly, what is the use of the shedding of my blood? Here is a soul so favored by me, and yet he is lost. Now, I wish to pause here because this is where we left off last week on the 7 p.m. hour. And I wish to pause here because Jesus pronounces this solemn statement that Judas is lost. Now, the blessed Lord chose Judas, and oftentimes Catholics are perplexed by this choice saying, if God knew Judas would be lost, why did he choose him to be a disciple and become an apostle? God must have made a mistake. In answer, Jesus, God, does not make mistakes, and it is proven by the fact of the choice of Judas and by the choice of the other apostles, all of whom abandon him at the moment of need. You see, God chooses us, each and every human being that bears his image and likeness, not by virtue of our holiness, not by virtue of the poor choices we make in life, even though God foresees them all, not by virtue of the fact that despite God's choice, we may be lost. Rather, God chooses us. Number one, because he loves us. And number two, for the talents he gives us to use in life. So even though we may misuse these talents that God gives us at conception and that are exercised from the moment we are able to reason and throughout our adulthood with the discovery of these talents God has given to us, whereby we, we more vehemently and purposefully exercise them, Above and beyond God's choice, there is the free will. God never violates the human free will. Even though God may see a soul will be lost, he still will go ahead and not only create that soul, bring it into existence and love it, but he will still endow it with talents which means his own grace that suffices despite the harshest trials it experiences in life. And if the soul should falter, should fail, it is not on account of the lack of God's grace, but rather on account of the perversion of the human will. So when God chose Judas, as well as all the apostles, to become his disciples, he knew that they were not men excelling in holiness. In fact, maybe one or two were in the semblance of holiness among those he chose. He chose them for their talents that he gave them. For it is by the exercise of these talents that holiness is attained. So God gave Matthew, the tax collector, this gift of apostleship. And he gave it to Judas. And he gave it to Peter. 
not because of their holiness, but because of the gifts, the talents, the skills with which God endowed them from conception and that later in life they would develop, but their free human will would choose whether or not to use these talents for God, for themselves, or against God. And even though God foresees that they may use them against him to their own ego or to their own pleasure, he will still never take back the gift. The church fathers taught God never takes back his gifts. Never. He may remove his favor from you, but he never takes back his gifts. Why? <clears throat> Because God, God's love does not vacillate like ours. Sometimes when someone offends us, what do we do? <clears throat> we say, oh, you lost my love. Change, then I will love you. God is not like that. God does the opposite. He doesn't say, change, then I will love you. He rather says, love somebody, then they will change. Don't make their change the condition of your love, rather make your love the condition of their betterment. Love somebody, and then they will change. So God never takes back his gifts precisely because his love will never be taken away from us. St. Paul says that. Despite sword, shipwrecks, plagues, famines, one thing that never that we can rely on that never changes is God's love. Even the souls who go to hell, like Judas, are loved in eternity by God to this day. Well, at the Last Supper, one thing I didn't share in the last segment that I'd like to share today is how slow the apostles were to understand the mystery of the Eucharist. They did not understand it. Some Catholics often wonder well, how much knowledge the apostles possessed of this transubstantiation that took place at the Last Supper. And the answer is not much. Consider volume 15. June 18th, 1923. Louisa relates, I was feeling completely absorbed in the most holy will of God. My most sweet Jesus let me see as though an act of his most holy will, the moment in which he, in instituting the most blessed sacrament, transubstantiated himself in the bread and wine. What wonders! What prodigies, what an excess of love in this act of transubstantiating himself. My mind wandered amidst so many divine prodigies, and my always beloved Jesus said, Beloved daughter of my supreme will, my will contains everything. It preserves all of the divine works as though an act, and nothing escapes it. And to one who lives in my will, it wishes to reveal all the blessings it contains. Therefore, I wish to reveal to you the reason for which I chose to receive myself when instituting the most blessed sacrament. This prodigy was great and incomprehensible to the human mind. For the soul to receive a man and a god to enclose the infinite in a finite being and to give to this infinite being divine honors, dignity, and a dwelling befitting him is beyond comprehension. This mystery was so abstruse and incomprehensible that the apostles themselves, while they easily believed in the incarnation and in my many other mysteries, were unsettled by this one, and their intellects were slow in believing. Therefore, I had to go over its meaning repeatedly in order to, for them to believe. 
So, how do I bring it about? In instituting the Eucharist, I myself provided for everything, as I wanted to ensure that the soul in receiving me should not deny my divinity the honors, the divine dignity, and a dwelling befitting God himself. So here we see that the apostles were slow in believing the mystery of the Eucharist, and Christ had to go over this mystery repeatedly to them to lead them to believe in it. Now, why is this? And why does it apply to us sometimes that when we read Louisa's writings, we just don't get it? You know, during this COVID lockdown, I do a lot of Zoom meetings on the divine will. I average about, let's say, um, maybe six to eight hours a week in Zoom meetings. And it is not uncommon for people to raise questions, and I love it, actually, because this is the school of learning. Questions is the school of learning. I can never be asked enough questions, because we are all students in the divine will, inasmuch as it is a huge mystery that we can never fully comprehend. For example, how can you or I explain God's one eternal operation that has neither beginning nor end, operating in the soul who lives in his will. Just try and give that a go. The most you can do is refer to the hypostatic union, which is the basis for this one eternal act in man. It's, a, it's called a theandric operation. Christ in his divine nature, performing an act which has neither beginning nor end in his human nature, which is made up of a series of acts that progress from potency to action. So the mind must think of what it is the body is to do in order for it to download this information to the will, relying upon experience, hence the memory, and the body, therefore, performs the action. So there's a series of steps in the human nature that must be observed in order for it to perform a human act. Now, infused within those steps of the human act, God's one eternal act of Christ's divine nature. That's the closest you can get to explaining how God's one eternal operation acts in the human being. At least intellectually, that's the closest you can get. You can use analogies, and these help tremendously. But to fully comprehend how God's one eternal act not only acts in human nature, but in so doing, impacts all creation, is mind-boggling. Therefore, during these Zoom meetings, I often hear questions and experience people's frustration of not fully getting it. And I tell them, don't fret, don't worry. And I say to them, do you worry about receiving communion? because of the fact that you don't see Jesus there, because of the fact that you may not palpably experience him when you receive him? Do you fret about that? No, they don't. So why should you fret about the divine will? They're both acts of faith. Certainly the divine will gives life to the sacraments, including the Eucharist, which makes it God himself. But... The apostles at the Last Supper were not simply fretting about not understanding the Eucharist. No, they, were, they went a step further. They did not want to believe in it. <laughs> See the difference? So Christ says they were slow in believing. He doesn't say slow in understanding. Slow in believing. In other words, they were not giving that act a scent of faith, which is necessary to receive the mystery of the Eucharist. They were resisting it. And these are the ones Christ chose. Why? Because of the talents he gave them, that he knew they were capable by God's grace 
of exercising in such a way that it would lead them to holiness. You see, the talents, the exercise of the talents God gives us in life engenders holiness, sanctity within us. And God gives various gifts, and there's no end to them, various talents to each and every one of us, to be placed, as St. Paul says, at the service of the church for the building up of the body of Christ until we become united. Where all the members are functioning in synchronicity, where we form the perfect stature of Christ. This is Paul's letter to the Ephesians. How do we do it? By exercising our talents for the glory of God and not for our own glory or Vain glory. So it's one thing for a person to be uh, slow in understanding the divine will, and that's perfectly fine. It takes time for us to assimilate more and more these truths, and Jesus you know, articulates this in Louisa's writings as well. When he tells her that little by little, we are given more knowledge of the divine will because the human mind, the human nature, is not capable of obtaining all the knowledge at once. But it is another thing for us not to be slow in understanding, but slow in believing. The difference between Mary and Zechariah in the New Testament is what? Both of them question the angel when the angel told them that a miracle would take place that they cannot fully understand. And I'm paraphrasing here, of course. Mary was told by the angel that she would conceive God. And she said, how is this possible? I made a vow of virginity. And Zechariah questioned the angel, how is it possible that Elizabeth will be pregnant in her old age? Mary was pleasing to God with her question. Zechariah was displeasing to God with his question. Why? The answer is slow to understand and slow to believe. Mary was slow to understand this mystery because of the human nature, which is finite. But once the angel told her that God, nothing is impossible with God, and therefore God will do the impossible in you by bringing to life in you God through a seed from heaven without any male. And Mary believed. She was slow initially in understanding, but she was not slow in believing. Zechariah, on the other hand, was not only slow in understanding, but he was slow in believing and resisted that belief. And for that reason, God struck him dumb. He became mute. Until God was pleased by his humility. And then he regained his speech when he allowed his wife Anne to choose the name of the son. That was an act of humility. So when we are coming across the writings of Louisa and we come across something difficult to understand, we can take the book and chuck it across the room and say, oh, this is nonsense. Or we can close the book and walk away and not open it again. And God will not give us the gift because we are not willing to believe. Believe and do the impossible. This was the statement of Bishop Sheen. Believe and you can do the impossible. He did not say, understand and you can do the impossible. Because we will never understand completely the mysteries of God which is what the sacraments mean, mysterion. Baptism, confirmation, confession, Eucharist, these are all mysteries because we cannot fully comprehend them. And they introduce us to a full participation in the life of God. But the divine will is the fullness of this participation in the life of God. It is God's real presence in us, which is referred to in Louisa's writings as is real life. The real life of God in the soul, which is identical to his presence in the Eucharist. The only difference? 
we do not become God, which the bread does. We retain our human creaturehood. You know, in the mystery of the Eucharist, God replaces the substance of the bread. And the substance becomes literally God. The same dynamism happens in us with the substance of our nature, but not our person. See the difference? God is, Jesus has one person, which is divine, and two natures, human and divine. We have one person, which is human, and which will always be human. It will never become divine. So we retain our human creaturehood, but we participate while having a human nature in the divine nature to the point in which the person of Christ himself that enters the Eucharist enters our intellect, our memory, our will, with the Father and with the Spirit, whereby all three operate in the three faculties of our soul. And this is new. The Son of God coming into us as he enters the Eucharist, substantially within us whereby we become living hosts and our bodies living tabernacles. So Jesus tells Louisa in volume 24 on September 24th, 1928, my daughter, it is our, the Trinity's, usual way to give truths we want to manifest little by little because man is incapable of receiving all of our truths within his soul at once. We use this method to let the life of the truth that we have revealed mature within him, and taking great delight in seeing matured in the soul the beautiful works that the life of our truths produces, we feel drawn by the beauty of what we have manifested to reveal yet more truths. And this is why we give the soul time, so that it may have the occasion to masticate and assimilate these truths. And we may have the occasion of delighting and manifesting yet more truths. You see, he also tells her on May 30th, 1925, in volume 17, it behooves you to know that when I reveal to you one truth, on the knowledge of my will, only then do I decide to open another door of my knowledge. That is, only when you have allowed all the goodness of the truth that I have revealed to you to penetrate your soul. If I did not do so, you would have only the knowledge of that, that that goodness that is contained in that truth exists but you would not possess the goodness itself. See how gentle God is with us? And this is why he waited 4,000 years from the expulsion of Eden to the Incarnation. You see, when Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden, they lost the infused knowledge of God's divine will and of all properties, of all the animals and plants, and chant and medicine, they lost it all because of one act of disbelief. The irony of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is this. It was the tree of knowledge. And yet, they already had knowledge. He had the knowledge of God, infused knowledge. But when Satan deceived Eve, who in turn deceived Adam, who both in turn betrayed God's covenant, they disbelieved God. So they went from an act of seeking to understand more to an act of disbelief in their Creator. And that is why God expelled them both. They disbelieved that God knew more than Satan. 
and would be for them eternal life. They vested their belief in Satan to give them eternal life through the knowledge of evil, which they, God did not want them to possess. Little by little, we obtain, because of original sin, the truths of the divine will that Adam and Eve possessed in one instant. And yet, they were to grow in that infused knowledge. in union with the divine will. So Adam and Eve were given in one broad sweep, in one moment at their creation, infused knowledge, immaculacy, immortality. They were given it all. But yet they had to still prove to God their loyalty by passing the test of the forbidden fruit. And if they had passed that test, they would continue to grow in union with the will of God in that state of infused knowledge. This is a teaching of the fathers and of the church. Adam was called to aspire to higher degrees of holiness, even in his state of immaculacy. See, the state of union with God, even in the blessed in heaven and the angels in heaven, is not stagnant, irreformable. It's a dynamism. It's constantly evolving and growing in union, in holiness. And this is reflected in one of the early century ecclesiastical writers, Pic de la Mirandole, which is quoted in a book by Cardinal Schonborn called From Death to Life, The Christian Journey in which he states, O Adam, you are equally free to be reborn in higher divine forms through your own decision. And Jesus reveals to Louisa that Adam had to grow not only in holiness, in his state of immaculacy, but also in knowledge. He tells Louisa in volume 34, June 3rd, 1928, Adam did not know everything. We acted like a father who does not tell everything at once to his little child. But little by little, as the child keeps growing, wants to give his child new surprises. This serves to maintain the living love between the father and the son. And with each new surprise, to increase their joy and happiness. Unquote. So if Adam, on the one hand, had this infused knowledge of all the properties of plants and herbs and knowledge of animals who obeyed his every nod and had mastered the knowledge of all science and chant and art and language, he still did not know everything. God was still revealing to him new truths. And this gives us an insight into how Jesus, in his human nature, which was identical to Adam's innocent human nature, had to grow in age, knowledge, and wisdom. Jesus' divine intellect, divine memory, divine will was informing throughout his human life, his human intellect, his human memory, his human will, in matters pertaining to certain situations, though knowing from eternity that he was God, of course, and his mission was that of First, Savior, second, Redeemer, third, Master. First, he was to save us from Satan and sin. Then he was to redeem us, and then he was to instruct us. Of course, all these overlap, but in order of priority, he was first a Savior. And this is what separates Jesus from all other of these world leader founders, world religion founders. If someone asks you, what's the difference between Jesus Christ and Mohammed or Confucius or, or um, leaders of these other churches? You tell them, they all have the claim of being a teacher, but only Christ has the claim of being a savior. Only one person conquered death by rising from the dead and saved us from death itself. 
and that is Christ. No other teacher has that claim. We'll take a break here and remind you, listeners, first I want to thank you for tuning in and taking care of your spiritual state by wanting to learn more about the teachings of Christ revealed to us through Scripture, through the Church, and through the Servant of God, Luisa Picareta. And now I encourage you to continue to pray for Radio Maria. It is completely supported by you. Continue to be generous in this Lenten season with your prayers, with your monetary offerings, because it is 100% listener-supported and commercial-free. And during this Lenten season, what better time than now to give attention to Christ and Mary on this first Saturday and through the readings of the Hours of the Passion. This work, the Hours of the Passion, is the most indulgenced work in the history of Christianity. If read meditatively with a proper disposition, we can save with every word we recite a soul. We can help convert it, we can help sanctify it, and we can help save it. And in the 7 p.m. hour, Jesus invites us to do precisely that. For after having educated the apostles on the mystery of the Eucharist, he turns to them with refulgent lies, with light and love, as though wanting to make them understand the mystery of this Eucharist and Judas, the great evil he is about to commit. And he proceeds to the Last Supper, where he bilocates his divinity and his humanity within the bread and the wine. Louisa continues into the 8 p.m. hour. My sweet Jesus, love ever inexhaustible, I see that as you finish the legal supper with your disciples, you stand up and along with them raise a hymn of thanksgiving to the Father for having given you food. In this hymn you offer reparation for souls who fail to give thanks to God for all the things he gives them and that sustain their health. O oh, Jesus, this is why in everything you do, touch or see, you always have on your lips the words, Thanks be to you, O oh Father. I too, united with you, Jesus, take the words from your very lips, and always and in all things I say, Thank you for myself and for all in order to continue to offer reparation for souls who fail to give thanks to God. O oh my Jesus, it seems that your love has no respite. I see that you have your beloved disciples again sit down. You take a basin of water, wrap it a white cloth around your waist, and prostrate yourself at their feet. You do so with a gesture so humble that it draws the attention of all the heavenly inhabitants and enraptures them. The apostles themselves remain almost motionless in seeing you prostrate at their feet. But tell me, my love, what is it you desire? What do you intend to do through such a humble act? an act of humility never before seen and which will never be seen. And Jesus to Louisa, O oh, my child, I seek out all souls and prostrate at their feet like a poor beggar I am asking, persisting and crying out to them as I devise loving stratagems to win them over. 
prostrate at their feet, where this basin of water mixed with my tears, I desire to wash them of all imperfection and prepare them to receive me in the most blessed sacrament. I so much cherish this act of them receiving me in the Eucharist, and I do not want to entrust this office to the angels, nor even to my dear mother. But I myself want to purify them in their innermost fibers and dispose them to receive the fruit of the sacrament. I intend through the apostles to prepare all souls. I intend to offer reparation for all holy works and for the administration of the sacraments, especially by priests that are carried out with a spirit of pride, without a divine disposition, and with tepidness. Oh, how many good works reach me more to dishonor me than to honor me, more to embitter me than to please me, more to give me death than to give me life. These are the offenses which sadden me most. Ah, yes, my child, count all of the most intimate offenses they commit against me and offer me reparation with my own will. Console my embittered heart. O my afflicted Jesus, I make your life my own. And with you I intend to offer reparation for all these offenses. I want to enter into the most intimate recesses of your divine heart and offer reparation with your own heart for the most intimate and secret offenses you've received from your dearest ones. Oh, my Jesus, I want to follow you in everything, and with you I want to go to all souls who are about to receive you in the Eucharist and enter into their hearts to unite my hands with yours and purify them. I beseech you, O Jesus, with this water and these tears of yours with which you washed the feet of the apostles, let us wash souls who will receive you Let us purify their hearts. Let us inflame them and shake off the dust with which they are sullied, so that when they receive you, you may find in them your sanctification rather than the bitterness you are forced to experience. But, my affectionate and good Jesus, while you are all intent on washing the feet of the apostles, I look at you and I see another sorrow that pierces your most sacred heart. These apostles represent all the future children of the Church, and each of them, the series of each one of your sorrows. In some, you discover weakness. In others, deceit, hypocrisies, and excessive love for personal interests. In St. Peter, you discover the lack of resolve and all the offenses of church leaders. In St. John, the offenses of your most faithful ones. In Judas, all the apostates with the whole gamut of the great evils they commit. Oh, your sorrow is so stifled by pain and love that unable to contain it, you pause at the feet of each apostle and burst into tears, praying and offering reparation for each of these offenses and imploring the appropriate remedy for all of them. Beloved Jesus, I too unite myself to you. I make your prayers, reparations, and your appropriate remedies for each soul my own. I want to mix my tears with yours so that you may never be alone, but may always have me with you to share in your pains. 
But sweet love of mine, as you continue to wash the feet of the apostles, I see that you are now at Judas' feet. I hear your labored breath. I see that you not only cry, but sob. And as you wash those feet, you kiss them and press them to your heart. Unable to speak, because your voice is stifled with sobs, you look at him with eyes welled up with fears and say to him from your heart, My child, oh please, I beg you with a voice of my tears, do not go to hell. Give me your soul, which I ask of you, prostrate at your feet. Tell me, what is it you seek? What is it you search for? I will grant you everything you seek, but do not allow yourself to be lost. Oh, please spare me, your God, this sorrow. And again you press those feet to your heart, but in seeing the callousness of Judas, your heart is cornered. Your heartache stifles your voice, and you are about to faint. My heart and my life, Allow me to sustain you in my arms. I understand that these are the loving devices you use with every obstinate sinner. But oh, please, love of my heart, I beg you to allow me to go around the earth with you as you partake in your passion and offer reparation for the offenses you receive from souls who are obstinate in not wanting to convert. Wherever there are obstinate sinners, let us give them your tears to soften them, and your kisses and loving embraces to bind them to you in such a way that they cannot escape. In this way, you will be consoled in your pain over the loss of Judas. Well, thank you for joining in, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, in the season of Lent. We will continue next week where we left off in this 8 p.m. hour of the Passion. Until then, may God keep you safe in mind, body, and soul, and bless you and protect you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.